So good morning, everybody, and thank you so much uh, for being here for our re-envisioning 21st century libraries and affordable housing panel. Um, my name is Michelle Delalos, and I'm the executive director of the Fifth Avenue Committee. And as many of you know, Fifth Avenue Committee um, is a 40 plus uh, year old nonprofit comprehensive community development corporation whose mission is to advance economic and social justice. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is uh, building affordable housing and community facilities. Uh, Today's panel will share key lessons that Fifth Avenue Committee, the Brooklyn Public Library, and our incredible partners have learned in creating New York City's first 100% affordable housing and public library project in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. The project's in construction right now. Um, the journey getting there, though, actually began more than a decade ago, believe it or not. Um, and as many of you know, um, you know, an important resource for affordable housing development has been vacant and underutilized land. And about, uh, and that's becoming more and more scarce, and that's been the trend for a while. And so, but meanwhile, the need for affordable housing uh, continues to grow uh, pretty exponentially. And uh, so Fifth Avenue Committee began to look around at underutilized sites um, in the South Brooklyn communities that uh, we work in, um, whether those were supermarkets, uh, post offices, public libraries, um, sites that could support more development and in particular more affordable housing development. Um, at the same time, uh, public libraries were facing significant and continue to face significant capital needs. And I remember the day uh, very, very clearly um, when I uh, was meeting with then council member Tish James um, in her office um, about Fifth Avenue Committee's um, affordable home ownership project, uh, Atlantic Terrace, in Fort Greene. And she had just met um, with the Brooklyn Public Library, and she was pretty exasperated, honestly, um, by the extent of the capital needs that the libraries um, were presenting and, and needed. And um, basically a light bulb you know, went off and said, and I said, you know what, I think we can help. We can create a win-win situation um, where we can help uh, public libraries and build a much needed affordable housing in our communities. Um, and with the help of Magnuson Architecture and Planning, um, FAC began doing a feasibility study of a number of library sites in a number of council districts in Brooklyn um, to determine uh, what was possible, what development, you know, where, where things could be feasible um, with the financing that existed at that moment in time. So fast forward a decade later and after the Great Recession and we all had to like focus on other things for a little while. Um, and here we are after all of that work and we've combined the efforts of two nonprofit organizations two uh, government um, housing agencies, two architectural firms, attorneys, several sources of financing, and the support of uh, council member Carlos Menchaca and the local community, and we're here to share our lessons learned um, so that that important model can be replicated. Um, and as some of you already know, that it, the model is being replicated in Inwood um, with cloth, Alembic, and Children's Village, um, and, a, and a very significant project that went forward as part of the Inwood rezoning. And I, I really couldn't be more thrilled about that. Um, and as, as Eric Kleinberg outlines in his book, Palaces for the People, How Social Infrastructure Can Help Fight Inequality, Polarization, and the Decline of Civic Life, public libraries and other community spaces are the physical infrastructure that supports and sustains the social cohesion our communities and our society so desperately need at this time. So I'd like to invite up Julie Sandorf, the president of the Charles Revson Foundation. Um, Julie and Revson, um, more than any other New York City institution, honestly, have helped to elevate the discussion about and the, and the role that public libraries play in our societies and communities throughout New York City through many efforts, um, including the creation of the annual New York City Neighborhood Library Awards. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to thank her for her support. It's really been incredible. Um, and ask that she come up and share some brief remarks. Thank you. Good morning. 
Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I first want to thank the Fifth Avenue Committee for organizing this conversation and for its pioneering work in partnering with Brooklyn Public Library to redevelop the Sunset Park Library as a state-of-the-art library, doubling its size, and by providing the critically needed affordable housing for the community. The Revson Foundation is proud to have made an early formative investment in this project. I also want to applaud Michelle De La Uz and Jay Marcus for recognizing that community development and branch libraries are inextricably bound together. That libraries are what Eric Kleinenberg, as, as Michelle, who Michelle just referenced, calls essential social infrastructure, as powerful a tool in the equity toolbox as physical redevelopment. Your neighborhood library is open to everyone providing an open and non-judgmental environment, freely offering access, access to all members of community without regard to race, citizenship, age, education, economic status, or any other qualifications or conditions. They are our civic squares, our palaces for the people. As architectural historian Sarah Williams Goldhagen has said about community libraries, people are weary of bowling alone. They need places where they can engage with others like and unlike them, places that help constitute them into some consti that help constitute them into and symbolically represent their community. I would be hard pressed to find a better alignment of values and dedication to equity than community developers and branch libraries. All of two, New York City's 217, it's a lot. Public libraries are within a half mile walking distance from every New Yorker's home. These libraries received over 32 million visits last year, more than all sports arenas, museums, and performing arts institutions combined. They offer thousands of programs, ranging from infant and toddler story hours in 12 languages, to robotics contests, after school tutoring, homework help, free passes from 40 museums, job search assistance, tech training, and senior arts, culture, and social activities, including a virtual bowling league. <laughs> Libraries are the biggest providers of English as a second language class in the city and are centers for citizenship and legal assistance for immigrants. They are the places where people from all walks of life rub shoulders, work together, play together, and just be together. Our libraries are also the single biggest contributor to closing the digital divide for over three million New Yorkers without high-speed internet service. In Queens alone, over 30% of the residents do not have broadband access or a computer at home. When job searches require online applications and homework requires access to the internet, the library serves as often the only tool for social and economic mobility. In the mid-1970s, our branch libraries experienced the same downward trajectory of disinvestment as did the neighborhoods that all of you work hard in. New York City's fiscal crisis reduced branch service from seven days a week to three days a week with no service on the weekends. Capital investment in libraries disappeared for decades leaving many branches in decrepit condition. Today, through the mobilization of patrons, frontline librarians, and leadership from all, system, all, leadership from all three systems, the city has increased hours to six days a week. Capital budget allocations have increased, but nowhere near to the levels needed to rebuild the branches. The branches are challenged with over $1 billion in capital needs, the consequences of neglect are experienced every single day. For example, in 2018, the Brooklyn Public Library lost 629 hours of service due to unplanned closures at 35 of their 59 branches. In February alone, the Borough Park, Macon, and Washington Irving libraries all closed unexpectedly due to heating failures. So, how can community developers join forces with our libraries to ensure that this crucial element of social infrastructure 
meets the needs and the demands of the community. Well, number one, we can follow the lead of BPL and Fifth Avenue Committee, and most recently NYPL and Inwood, to rebuild the deteriorating branches as 21st century libraries and affordable housing. In 2008, and it's probably in parallel when you were doing it, Michelle, the Revson Foundation commissioned the Pratt Center to conduct a GIS survey of potential sites and a cost-benefit analysis of rebuilding libraries as mixed-use housing and libraries. Uh, the analysis found that upwards of 20 sites, library branch sites, that are on city-owned land and that have 20,000 square feet or more of unbuilt residential FAR and who are not Carnegie or historic buildings would be suitable for such redevelopment. And due to shared systems and zero acquisition costs, because these libraries are on city-owned land, the cost of rebuilding the library is reduced by 40%. And the benefit to the community? Well, that's priceless. The second thing we could do is to join forces with branch libraries and advocate for reinvestment in your community social infrastructure. First, advocate to extend and not cut library hours. Um, across the city, we have information deserts. As one example, the last bookstore in the Bronx, Barnes & Noble, <coughs> closed last year. It was open 79 hours a week versus the average library branch in the Bronx, which is open less than 50 hours a week, with most closed on Sundays. The mayor's FY20 budget cuts almost $9 million from the library's operating budget. This in a year in which the 2020 census count, which will, for the first time, be online, will rely heavenly, heavily on the branch libraries for internet service and guidance for filling out the forms. Now is not the time to cut service, but to extend hours every evening so everyone could be counted. Third, join forces with the branch libraries in forming partnerships. How, many library, how can libraries support your mission? What do they uniquely contribute to your community development goals? Secondly, do all of the tenants in the buildings you own and manage have library cards? Do they know all about the programs and cultural events and services pro provided at their neighborhood library? These are just a few examples of the ways in which community development and neighborhood libraries could partner. I'm hoping this morning's conversation sparks many, many, many creative ideas um, and with great partnerships in the near and long-term future. Thank you. So I'm gonna invite up uh, San Marks, who is certainly uh, well-known in the community development field here in New York City. He's the head of New York City LISC. Um, and not only is he a great moderator, um, but uh, he, you know, he uh, and LISC, New York City, and uh, NEF are partners in this project, and um, it's critical. They play a critical role um, during pre-development and continuing on, um, so he'll be able to bring that perspective in addition to keeping um, this large but very knowledgeable panel on point. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle, um, and thanks everyone for, uh, for coming today. Um, I want to do just a quick read of the room. Let's do a first, like, bride side, groom side thing. Uh, how many pe people here are primarily, like, housing people, affordable housing interested people? Okay. How many people are primarily library people? Okay, great. How many people raise their hands both times for that? Great, excellent. And how many people are here from like finance, banks, stuff like that? Great. How many people from like legal side of things? I saw a couple of lawyers in the room. How many like design architects, planners, things like that? I saw a planning hand go up. Okay, great. That, that, that helps. So uh, it is a, a, a gigantic and knowledgeable panel uh, here. My role will be to try to keep things crisp and moving. Um, I will pull out a couple of themes, I think, today around collaboration across all these different uh, types of disciplines here, uh, as well as I think you're going to hear a lot about just like responsiveness to community and how that was baked into the process. 
To start things off, though, I'm going to have like a quick lightning round with each of the panelists. Their bios are in the, uh, uh, the paper, so I'm not going to read them all off. I'm going to ask them one quick lightning round question, uh, and that is uh, something I like to call check your bias. What is like the one thing that this audience should know about you to help them like contextualize what you're going to say today? What's the one thing that they should know? And I will start to model it, uh, which is <clears throat> as the executive director of LISC New York City, a community development nonprofit, a community development intermediary. Um, my point of view on things is like to be in the middle of everything, a mile wide and an inch deep. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, kind of like not a master of any one specific discipline. That's kind of my bias and point of view. Uh, so let's go down the road. Just introduce yourself, your name, and your affiliation, and check your bias. Let's start with David. Okay. Uh, I'm David Wallach. I'm the uh, Executive Vice President for External Affairs from Brooklyn Public Library. Um, we're we're going to spend a lot of time talking about library buildings today in Sunset Park. The old library, the interim library, the new library that we're getting. Um, but the point I want to make is libraries are fundamentally not about the buildings, they're not about the books or the computers, they are about the people that work in the library. Um, Roxana Benavides is the chief librarian in the Sunset Park Library, she's here today. Um, <laughs> And at the heart of this story is that team in the branch. And as we'll get into, we would not be here today if it wasn't for the deep ties that Roxana and her team in the branch have with the community. It's a fundamental part of uh, the story we're gonna talk about. Great, Jay? Um, Jay Marcus, Fifth Avenue Committee. Um, I think probably Michelle already mentioned it, but for Fifth Avenue Committee, the key thing that we always have is our mission, social and economic justice. So uh, for us, that's what brings us and makes projects like this so appealing because it, it not only addresses the affordable housing, but also, as, as Julie Sandoff very well put, how important libraries are in low-income communities and uh, immigrant communities in the 21st century. So for us, again, it's, it's our mission, economic and social justice. Perfect, Molly. Good morning. Uh, I'm Molly Park. I'm Deputy Commissioner for Development at the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. I think with that I've used up my minute. Um, <laughs> uh, it is my job to be pragmatic, right, to hear everybody's vision for what a perfect project looks like, layer that together uh, with the funding constraints and other regulatory concerns, and at the end of the day, get things done. If I hold out for the for perfect project and nothing happens, I've failed. So. Um, it is at the end of the day about getting to the getting to the finish line. Great. Awesome. Uh, buenos dias, everyone. I'm Carlos Menchaca, city council member representing uh, the really cool district that includes Sunset Park and Red Hook. Uh, my my bias is really connected to my commitment to building a platform for neighborhoods to speak and to understand and use their power. Uh, so my job is to make everyone else uncomfortable. Uh, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, the uh, colleagues, my colleagues. And I think that hopefully you'll get that sense today in how we keep moving forward uh, in a community that's rapidly gentrifying and full of a lot of fear. But beyond the fear, there's incredible vision that I think is not just worth hearing about, but worth empowering. Great. Nicole. Hi, uh, Nicole Ferreira. I am the SVP of Multifamily Finance at New York State Homes and Community Renewal. What does that mean? <laughs> um, that my team is responsible to deliver on the governor's housing plan. And I think the thing, um, you know, I echo Molly, uh, like we have a lot of projects coming at us. Um, and from the seat I sit in, it's a very large state, very different communities as you travel upstate um, versus downstate. Um, but the reason the state was really in this project and stuck with it um, is not necessarily just the housing piece, but is the community investment fund dollars we funded for, for the library build out. Um, and I'll talk about that uh, today. It's, it's really 
we need a hook also to sort of get us to move projects forward because we have so much coming at us and the library aspect of this project was that big hook. Great, Christine. Hi, I'm Christine Coletta. I'm an attorney at Hirsch and Singer in Epstein. We were the project attorneys representing Fifth Avenue Committee. So there's my bias. Um, <laughs> we, I see my job not just as spotting issues, but also helping to solve issues. Um, and I think the team, we'll hear a lot today about teamwork and how everyone worked together to solve issues. And on a personal note, I actually, um, when I first moved to New York, taught ESL at the Sunset Park Library. So oh, wow. I can know and appreciate the value of that space in particular. Right. Christine. Hi, I'm Christine Hunter. I'm a partner with Magnuson Architecture and Planning. We're the base building and housing architects for the project. And we've the, our firm has been focused for 30 years on the design of affordable housing and urban revitalization projects as a foundation for vibrant and sustainable neighborhoods. Um, in recent years, as land, the availability of land has dwindled, our projects have been getting more complicated and we're more and more challenged with these complex mixed use buildings that make the most of scarce land and resources. Carol? Okay, thanks Sam. So, uh, so what's my bias? Um, I'd start by saying that I've spent the better part of my career um, working in the public sector and primarily in New York City. Um, I think I and my firm, we believe that architecture serves people first, as, as David had mentioned. Um, so we also have, have lofty goals, that, and we say that architecture does have the potential to um, lift, the human, lift the human spirit and improve the human condition, and I think this is a great way to be able to do it. Um, the, we believe that the built environment shapes how people interact and that well-designed spaces can create the framework for better interactions. So the goal is to create architecture that is welcoming, uh, flexible, and durable, and at the same time responds to the unique needs of each client and location. Um, finally, I think it's said, and I think it's really true, that a good client helps make good architecture and a great client helps make great architecture. So. Great. Clarence. Good morning, Clarence Burley, Bank of New York Mellon. So um, yeah, I guess it's my role to kind of throw a little cold water on things. I'd say my bias would certainly be conservatism. Um, you know, my institution, Bank of New York Mellon, I'll save you the whole backstory, but 1784, Alexander Hamilton, conservative, we haven't survived this long by taking unnecessary risks. And I think that, you know, that certainly reflects our, our institution, uh, conservatism. Um, and my role here uh, on the panel is as construction lender, but also there is a permanent lender and we are the tax credit investor in the project as well. So I was told that it was physically impossible to get two more chairs on the <laughs> stage here for the panel. So kind of my comments will represent all of the financing team, which represents construction lending. And then also the permanent lender, obviously, you know, anything that is of concern to them would be, you know, of concern to us because they're our loan repayment source. So, um, yeah, that's me. Perfect. And I, I will also put another uh, invisible chair on, on the panel for uh, Emily Chen from National Equity Fund, who's here. Um, NEF is, a, is an affiliate of LISC uh, and the syndicator of the tax credits that Bank of New York was the investor. Um, okay, so it's a big panel. This is the biggest panel I've ever had to moderate, and uh, it channeling Michelle, because uh, we talked a lot about this, it really does take all of these different perspectives to make a complex project like this come together. How I'm gonna organize this is essentially in three different conversations. We'll have a first conversations among the principals, uh, the, 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 uh, the library and Fifth Avenue committee, the real estate development team. We'll have a second conversation about the public sector and how that intersected. And then we'll have a third conversation about all the technical pieces, design, legal, and financing that brought it all together, all right? So starting with the principals, uh, and I will throw this to David. Um, what was the particular, what's, what's like the origin story you have around this partnership with Fifth Avenue Committee, a unique type of partnership, and what was the primary problem that you were solving for in coming to, to FAC? Um, so there were really two sets of problems coming together. Um, and and Ju Julie and Michelle both alluded to 
the libraries, and not just Brooklyn Public Library, but all three library systems in the city are, are, are financial struggles. But let me, let me just ex explain that in a little more detail and where we were five, five years ago. So we have, Brooklyn Public Library has 59 branches um, throughout the borough. Um, at that point, we had about $300 million in unfunded capital needs. Um, so there were even more needs, some of which were funded, but we had $300 million worth of problems, broken boilers, broken HVAC systems, broken roofs, um, branches in desperate need of, of, of being modernized, for which there was no funding. And as Julie had alluded to, that, that program, that, that problem goes back um, decades. Um, on average, we were getting about $15 million a year in capital funding from the city. So you can do the, the, the math. Um, we were just falling further and further behind. So that, that was the general problem. At, at Sunset Park, um, this specific set of problems included unfunded capital needs. There were about $6 million worth of needs um, in that building. Um, the branch had been built in the 70s. It actually had replaced a, a Carnegie Library, the South Library that had been torn down in 1970. Um, and it was uh, one of our Lindsay boxes, standalone, very utilitarian, um, and um, uh, in, in desperate need of being brought into the, the, the 21st century, um, like a lot of our Lindsay boxes. And there was a particular problem, that Sunset Park um, uh, was um, uh, a, uh, a heavy user of this branch. The Sunset Park Library was one of the busiest libraries in our system. Um, it was 12,000 square feet, which made it an average size library on the small side. It literally was bursting at the seams every, every day. Um, and um, uh, it, needed, it needed to be bigger. We were never gonna get to building a bigger library on the path that we were on. Um, around that time, we were beginning to take a different approach to our libraries generally. Um, we couldn't just stay on the same path of waiting for capital funding and going to the Department of Design and Construction to repair buildings. We just never, we, we would just, we would keep falling further and further behind. We were starting to look into more creative solutions, um, including what we were doing at Brooklyn Heights, um, with a private developer, which was gonna raise revenue for the rest of the system. Um, we were be beginning to explore an opportunity to add a second floor to our Greenpoint Library through a special environmental fund. We were talking to the Children's Museum about co-locating in Crown Heights. We were starting to do things uh, that we had not done before. And around that time, we were approached by Jay with the Fifth Avenue Committee. Perfect segue, you're like doing my moderating for me. Just trying to help you out, Sam. Yeah. Uh, so major capital needs, bursting at the seams, outmoded real estate, and along comes Jay. Jay, what was the problem that Fifth Avenue Committee was, was solving for? Um, well, I mean, it's housing development, so you know there's a lot of problems. Uh, but the, uh, I mean, I, I think the primary problem is the one that's endemic to um, affordable housing development, community development generally, which is you're, you're already starting off um, particularly because this is R7A, so it's not as high density uh, that you need very often to get economies of scale, that you're already starting off with a very tight budget. And then you, as a community development agency, you wanna make sure this is gonna be a long-term benefit to the community. So when the community started talking about wanting majority two and three bedroom apartments, which cuts down on the number of units uh, that you can do, and when also we started hearing from the library community that because in this place in particular, classroom space is very important, having that second floor space, not just the, the first floor and the cellar, but also the second floor space was very important because that's a more conducive, separate environment for things like classrooms. Uh, it made it even harder to make the numbers work. So um, I think that was the big challenge. We also went in knowing that we were, the, even though R7A is not as high density as a lot of the rezonings now happening, uh, we know this was the first, even though was, rezoning was in 2008, I believe, uh, we knew this was the first R7A. So we knew if there's mistrust already for anything that's, quote, development, us building the first eight-story building in this neighborhood, uh, we knew would also encounter 
some mis more mistrust mm -hmm. and more concern about gentrification because coming north from Fourth Avenue, uh, those larger buildings were starting to happen. I think those were the major challenges, but we were very lucky. Um, you know, um, certainly the city council member came to the table very aggressively with both political support, explaining things to the community, asking them to be patient, build trust on the political side. The city uh, came to the fore with ab above term sheet subsidies, thank you very much, and the state really went above and beyond. Actually, ultimately, the Community Investment Fund, which goes towards the library, uh, the Corn Shell Library, actually, they gave us more than what we asked for. Um, they happened to increase the maximum for that program the year after we applied, and they very generously not only did that, but also reformatted how they structured that financing to make it, again, to help us to leverage more money. So everyone came to the table um, uh, to address that was, was the biggest challenge. The numbers don't work when you really want to meet all these community development needs. Jay, FAC was also, like, you were looking into library housing partnerships well before the Sunset Park project emerged, right? What was the driver of, like, trying to work with libraries in the area of Brooklyn where you were working? Uh, well, I mean, M Michelle, I, I think she articulated also, FAC had been very interested in this concept generally of unused air rights with libraries as an opportunity to both improve the libraries and to build the affordable housing. So, um, you know, with that, that kind of led to say, hey, this is interesting. I'd also heard a little about the Brooklyn Heights project, mm -hmm. and I thought it, that's a great concept that they're using the air rights to help to get new capital dollars for the lower income neighborhoods. And I thought, well, if they, now if they have that potential resource beyond the more minimal capital dollars they have each year, maybe it's a good time to approach them. And, and we were very lucky that they were interested in working with us. Great. So we're going to pivot to the uh, public sector piece of the conversation. Uh, Jay and David, I invite you to listen actively because I'm going to ask you to comment, amend, change, agree, disagree with stuff that they say. Um, Molly, you are, like you said, you know, in the place where the rubber hits the road as far as the city's concerned, and you're under pressure to take an ambitious housing plan and translate it into actual projects. Can you talk about how this fit into the mayor's housing plan and why this became a priority uh, for HPD? Sure. Um, since I know there are some non-housers in the room, let me just start by giving sort of the, the 30,000 foot overview of the housing plan, 300,000 units over 12 years, 60% uh, preservation, 40% new construction. It is uh, emphasis on low income, meaning uh, house, serving households from about 55,000 for a family of three below, although there is moderate and middle income housing as well. Um, I could go into infinitely more detail about the housing plan, but in the interest of time, I won't. Um, but I think this plan really hit a lot of the key tenants, or this project hit a lot of the key tenants of the plan. Um, first of all, we've heard a few mentions to land. Um, you know, there was a point in time not all that long ago where the city controlled, you know, thousands of, of plots of land, thousands of buildings, and affordable housing was city-owned land, and that those two went hand in hand. That's not the case anymore, so we, part of the thing, one of the things that we've had to do in the housing plan is, as we've seen, um, look to grow our numbers is to look for new ways that we can leverage land, um, new sites, also that help us get into new neighborhoods. Um, this project is the first new construction development in Sunset Park in many, many years, new affordable housing development. So um, I think that right there speaks to one of the goals of the housing plan. Um, Pairing affordable housing with community assets is also another key tenant of the housing plan. Um, we are a housing agency, but we're also a community development agency. We want communities to be strong. We want, as we bring, as we help to bring new residents into a neighborhood, we want to make sure that the neighborhood is well positioned to serve those households. Um, and, and making, so we think about education, we think about parks, we, and thinking about libraries is a big piece of that. Um, this is a mixed income project, right? It is serving households from homeless up through moderate income. That is an enormous uh, priority of ours, um, both to make sure that we are serving the, the households in New York City that are most in need of affordable housing, but also that we are 
creating buildings that are going to be financially sustainable well into the future and um, making sure and, and doing the mixed income does that, right? It means that there is households paying a range of rents and that overall those buildings have enough operating income to survive and flourish for decades to come. Um, I think partnerships are a real hallmark of the housing plan and, and you know, as, as is clearly epitomized, this, this project is all about partnerships. Um, whether it's with the, the city and the state, um, don't, don't let the hype believe, fool you. We do work together very closely, very frequently, and, and I think this project is, shows that, but also it's um, public sector, private sector, it's different city agencies. Um, so I think in many really positive ways, this is a perfect reflection of the housing plan. Um, it is also a perfect reflection of the housing plan and how complicated it was. Um, you know, at the point in time where we did have thousands of city-owned sites and, and, you know, we did this essentially the same financing project over and over and over again, and we're not doing that anymore, right? Everything is complicated. Everything requires uh, layering on multiple different financing sources, bringing, solving really thorny issues. Um, and, and this project was no exception. Um, I think just uh, a few things that to uh, call out that were, were complicated but we solved for. Um, there, you know, library brought specific design needs to the table um, that were not typical for an affordable housing project. Um, figuring out how to solve for the, the fit out of the library space was involved a lot of creativity, right? We, we build housing and we know how to finance housing and our loan authorities support housing. Our loan authorities don't support uh, library fit out. So we have to solve for that as well. And then relocation to make sure that this sort of really important community asset of the library remains uh, functional during the construction period. Again, we know how to relocate tenants, even that's kind of hard, but we know how to do it. Relocating libraries is a whole new um, skill set for, for the city. So I think both in in many positive ways and then also in, a, in the sort of range of challenges, this, this project really epitomizes the housing plan. That's great. And, and Molly, I think you gave a really good sneak preview of the technical issues we'll get into around design and legal structure and financing, so that was, that was great. Uh, Council Member Manchaka, uh, from the best laid plans mm -hmm. to where the rubber hits the road, um, this was a project that was not without controversy. Can you talk about how you heard, of it, heard about it and you know, to Jay's point, you came out strongly in favor, but I'm sure you had to navigate a lot of tricky political waters to get to that stance. Give us some of the flavor of how you've interacted with this project. Thank you, and yes, uh, complicated, but also very controversial. Um, and, and for the things I think everyone's gonna relate to, so I, I don't think it's gonna be news for anyone, but, but I think when I, when I first heard about this, I had just gotten reelected, or not reelected, elected for the first time uh, in, in Sunset Park. And I think what's, what's important here is, is that this is a community that has been rapidly changing for, for a while now. And one of the things that I heard during the campaign, uh, and I beat out an incumbent, and that's important because I think, I think part of what, what, what's happening in our districts, uh, specifically in Sunset Park, is, is a, a mistrust of government. And that had been, that had been real, uh, and I think is real in a lot of neighborhoods. And so he hearing very intimately from folks about affordable housing, and not just affordable, but affordable for who, which ended up becoming a, uh, like a, a, a opposition campaign slogan. It's like, what is this? What, 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 what are these units? There's a lot of misinformation that we, I think, quickly responded with good information. But I think that mistrust of government was one of the things that I wanted to focus on and I continue to focus on in my work. How do you build bridges between communities who are, are full of fear, mistrust, misinformed, and par partly informed, but just not on the right side, or not, not on your side, I should say. And, and that was all playing out. One of the core things that I had to get over is a hurdle, which I think is still a hurdle and not necessarily reconciled within me, which is taking public land and, and then changing it to public private land. And this is what this is. And I think there's some fundamental folks in our cities that just don't believe that we should be selling our public property so that we, we have a, a joint effort. And I think that still exists. And that was one of those piece, pieces that I had to make a decision. 
do, do I believe that or do I believe that we, we can make, make something beautiful in the neighborhood? And I, and I chose to, to go with, we, we can make something really beautiful in the neighborhood. That doesn't take government out of the responsibility to figure that out so that we don't have to necessarily do that all the time. But I think this is the opportunity that brought us a brand new library and an incredible model uh, that I hope goes across to rebuild our libraries, which are incredible institutions. This is where I first learned English as a, as a young kid. My mom dropped me off in my library uh, so I can go to a, a, a program um, and, and learn English for the first head start. And, and so libraries are so precious to me. So this is what brought me to the table. I think what's important to say here too about the controversy is that once you get past the, the, the group of folks that are just never gonna support libraries being transformed with, with affordable housing on top, um, then you get to the, the, the affordable for who. And I think you heard from Molly, there, there are some very important markers that got met here that have not yet been met, probably in a lot of other projects. I have a lot of problems with MIH and how, how we're doing these, these projects that don't, don't bring this kind of level. I think everything should be 100% affordable, period, moving forward. I know that's hard, and I'm not the finance person, um, but that's the political vision that our neighborhoods are talking about. That's what they're asking for. Uh, the, the transition to the library was the other thing. Uh, I imagined what had happened, and there's another very beautiful asset um, in Sunset Park, and if you haven't been to the interim library, it's a beautiful space. In that space, if you could just imagine a whole bunch of desks and NYPD staff like clicking away at a computer, uh, processing applications, that's what it was used for, it's this gorgeous Greco, uh, beautiful arch old architecture. But the library project, this library project, allowed us to force the city to remove the NYPD from that floor and bring in this beautiful community asset. And so this is actually helping a longer vision of a community that had been wanting government to respond to them. And this, so this project is not just affordable housing and a, not, a brand new library, it's actually bringing back public space to the community in a very real way. So that's why it's special for me and why I'm gonna keep fighting for it and others. Great. Last thing, um, participatory budgeting, if you haven't heard of it, Google it, it's pretty awesome. Our district does the, the, like the best in the city every year. And this year we put an affordable housing project with FAC, yet again, I think some of the par same partners, um, to bring the same kind of concept, 100% affordable with a community use on the bottom. And so people got to vote on it. We haven't done the result, we, uh, um, we haven't pushed the results out yet, but I hope it comes up to the top two or three projects. Great. Thank you. Nicole. Uh, I think Molly mentioned that, you know, don't believe the hype, <laughs> city and state collaborate, right. um, and, but it's not on every project. No. So would love to hear how you heard about this one and why it rose to the top of the state's priority list in terms of collaborating with the city and all these folks. Sure, so um, just to level set, the, the governor's housing plan is a five-year housing plan. Um, it's 112,000 units uh, across the state. Um, and in New York City, um, we work very, very closely with HPD on, uh, on providing our units downstate. Um, and on the new construction side, we are typically sort of uh, focused on uh, supportive housing projects, um, given the high need uh, around homelessness. Um, and as I had mentioned earlier, the thing that brought the state to the table on this project, though, is um, you know we we obviously have a wide range of term sheets because on any given day I can be, you know, talking about an 80/20 in Midtown or a manufactured home park in a rural community. Um, so our housing is very very different um, based on and and you know gentrification and different needs, different issues and concerns as you go around the state. Um, but in, in this scenario, um, we have a term sheet called the Community Investment Fund. Um, so that targets uh, rural preservation projects, but also in urban areas, it targets um, retail uh, commercial space on ground floors that actually uh, serve the community needs. These are not banks. These are actual uh, um, things that could not be funded, uh, could not pay high rents. Um, but by putting those in the ground floor of buildings actually address uh, needs in the community. So the library fit perfectly with that program. Um, uh, I think FAC applied for our funding in December of 2014, uh, was granted uh, tax credits from us um, in May of 2015, 
and we didn't close on construction financing until June of 2018. Um, and if any of you who do uh, business with us know, we may have taken those credits back at some point in that time frame because that is a very long time for us to leave a financial commitment on the table without closing. Um, why did we stick with it? Why did we continue to roll those credits forward for this project? Um, so not only the library portion of it, but um, the incredibly low income uh, units that we were achieving here that Molly talked about. And also, um, you know, I mentioned it's a very large state and every municipality handles uh, or addresses their housing issues differently. But it was um, having investing in a project where the developer was engaged in the community engagement process. That is incredibly important to us. Um, we understand there's going to be opposition um, in, in different communities to projects, and uh, you know nothing's perfect. But the fact that the conversation was happening, there was leadership uh, from the council member, and you know you know the team continued to check back with us and. You know, there's a lot of hurdles. I think we had, uh, our, my team learned a lot about the temporary re relocation of the library, frankly. Um, that was a sticky issue that continues to pop up in conversations from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, though, the commitment of the development team uh, to, to continue in the conversation and engaging um, really kept us at the table. So, Great. and on a personal note, you know, uh, my grandmother brought me to my local library all the time and just not having an asset like that in the community I think uh, would be a, a, a real shame so so we before we go to the third conversation with all the sort of technical experts I want to just bring it back to the uh, the principal of the development team. Does anything in what the public sector folks said that you want to elevate underscore amend etc particularly I think around sort of community engagement and process. I think that was a theme that came up a lot. Yeah, um, a, a bunch of things, but I'll, I'll try, to, try to limit them. Um, I just want to come back to the, to the mistrust issue that, uh, that the councilman was talking about. Um, re really, really important, I think, from, 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 the, from the outset. And I think some of it um, had to do with fear, fear of change, fear, fear of, of lo losing uh, a public, public asset, um, how complicated the project was, things going on in the neighborhood. Um, and then let me come back to what I talked about in the very beginning. Um, you know, it's, we're all here, here now having gone through the, the, the Euler process and gotten the approval that, that we needed. Um, but if we go back a few years, that, you know, that was not a foregone conclusion. We had some, um, some uh, not, I guess, moderately contentious community board meetings. Um, uh, and we had to move some people along Councilman was, I think, really helpful during that process. But the other thing that really played a role was the trust that um, the uh, uh, librarians, Roxana in particular, had um, developed over all the years they had worked in the library. There was, um, there was really, I mean, deep love for her and the other staff um, in, in the branch. And that, that really turned out to be critical during that process that process and I'm not I'm not sure we would have gotten over everything um, if um, uh, if Roxana didn't have those kinds of relationships with with folks um, with folks in, in in the neighborhood um, you know in the, the Euler process sort of gets a bad bad rap but in a sense um, I, th I think it it looking back it helped make the project stronger the fact that we had to go through it I think we did a lot of outreach beyond the EULA process itself Carol will talk a little bit about um, the, uh, uh, the the design process um, uh, but but that was really that that, that was really important um, one of the other issue I just want to come back to is, is just to maybe should have done this in the beginning just in terms of Governance. One point to remember about the libraries is we are not um, we're not mayoral mayoral agencies. None of the three library systems in in, in the city. Um, if we were a mayoral agency, you know, then the mayor could just say, okay, HPD library, go, you know, go do do this project. The, the the library leadership really had to make a decision. Does this make sense for the, the library? What are the rewards? What are the risks? And as we went through. Um, what was a very complicated process, we had to make sure not only that it worked for us in the beginning, but that it's going to work for us 
um, at the uh, at, at the end. Um, and uh, um, so again, not a foregone conclusion. Um, in this case, for this library, this this approach, um, the library leadership came to the conclusion that it was worth worth whatever risks, worth the worth the fact that we were the first ones, um, and uh, um, we're now on a, on a path towards it uh, towards it paying off. Jay, any anything you want to add on on any of this? Um, no, no, just I, I, I think the, uh, uh, we made the strategic decision uh, early on that to help make it politically viable, we'd apply for the tax credits before we kicked off the Euler process. Mm -hmm. So you're already starting with the long delay there. Um, and, and we were lucky. I mean, you know, back then it was Ernie and Mike, and now it's yeah. Pauline, and they were all really smart people, but they, they did understand as you briefed them on it, hey, Euler's going to take a little longer because we have to build trust. And, and it really was exciting to see that when we started, the first meeting was like 150 people screaming at us. Um, and, and by the end, in the community board vote, it was an overwhelming in favor and, and that everyone worked together to really build that trust in, in the community, with, largely with city council members' leadership. So that was also good to see. But that took longer. And then the, you know, we made the commitment early on that we would not begin the project until the temporary location was not only found but fitted, and then it got you know a little more delayed as it the concept was, hey, let's try to help make this police station into in the long term something that'll be a real community benefit. Yeah. So I think the that was for us became a bigger challenge as the as what we knew would already be a long process got extended to a longer process, and we are very lucky that the city and state stuck with us in that. As well as uh, as well as the entire team here, which team a lot of them didn't get paid till construction closing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we really appreciate it. So a lot a lot of moving parts in a project like this, a lot of complexity, and uh, we're going to pivot now to the technical folks uh, because all of this vision and all of this relationship, all these relationships, and all of the you know putting the pieces on the chessboard, none of it can happen without you guys actually as, as uh, midwives to the, to, the, to the process. So Christine Coletta, we will start with you on the legal side. We are gonna get into design and pretty pictures, but first, we're gonna talk about some of the gnarly issues around deeds and restrictive covenants and all that fun stuff. So take it away, Christine. Yeah, this project had a few really interesting legal issues that came up. A few of them for me were even for case to first impression. Um, the first thing we had to really figure out was a legal structure. How was it going to work? What was it going to look like, both during construction and after construction? So the structure that the parties agreed to was that FAC would purchase the property from the city of New York for a dollar, some nominal amount, construct the project, which would be comprised of a three-unit condominium. And the condominium here is a commercial condo. Um, two of the condominium units are the affordable housing, and then the third condominium unit is the library. Once FAC is completed um, with construction, they'll transfer the condominium unit back to the city um, for use as a library. Um, it sounds simple, but that actually took us a long time to get to. <laughs> and um, we had a lot of questions as we've, and, and things that we're still working through um, regarding how, what the condominium will look like in perpetuity and how the parties will live together as neighbors. And um, certainly during construction, um, there were a lot of questions that we worked through regarding coordinating who was building what. I think probably everyone at this table had, had multiple conversations about the dreaded HVAC um, <laughs> the library. Um, never had that many conversations about an HVAC before, but it was really good. And everyone really worked together and came up with creative solutions um, for a structure that I'm now seeing in my practice replicated, um, both for the library, um, we're working on the Inwood the Inwood project, but also for other, um, you know, project with Fifth Avenue Committee that has a public use as a separate condominium unit with affordable housing in the so, same building. Christine, just to drill yeah. on the HVAC piece, are you trying <laughs> to say, like, in terms of, like, the, Jay's specialty, not mine. the <laughs> systems of the building, there were some systems that had to be shared among all parties and the infrastructure of the actual, like, guts of the building? Basically? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, the... The real pros can speak to that better than I, but um, you know, coordinating construction is something that's really important, and you know, making sure that people don't literally step on each other's toes, both from a you know funding perspective, who's funding what, what dollars are coming in when, and then who's actually completing the work is really important to hash out. Great. 
So the other um, big issue that we dealt with was kind of a nerdy one, but um, really interesting, and I think it's something that we'll be dealing with a lot in the future. Um, in the beginning, the library made it very clear that it was important that this that that if the project went bust and the bank foreclosed on the on the developer, that it be that the obligation to build a library remain, and um, that was very clear from the beginning that, that was a, a, a very big priority. And and that too sounds simple and straightforward, but it's a real lending concern, and it's something that some lenders would really have an issue with. Um, we call it subordination, um, but basically the concept is. Who, who prevails if there's a fight? Does the bank get to step in and do whatever they want, or does the bank step in and have to build a library? And um, I think in this circumstance, the partners were extraordinarily lucky to have Bank of New York as a, as a lending partner and um, an NEF, because they really got it. And um, it was really important to get in front of this issue really early, um, address it head on, note that it was a strong priority for the library, and, um, and the bank was an incredible partner there, working out a legal structure that made sense and that you know, would, would honor that commitment. Um, the third one has to do with um, that, that, that transfer that happens when, when FAC transfers the property back to the library for the dollar, typically we see that happening when the construction's complete. Um, when the developer has completed all of their obligations under construction financing and we're ready to move into the permanent phase. In this situation, we actually saw an opportunity for the library to come in a little earlier. Um, and that has to do a lot with the coordination as well. Um, and in part due to a very generous amount of money they got from the state and the community investment fund. Um, and here too, the banks and, and the investor really worked with us to come up with a way so that we could turn over the keys to the library a little bit earlier than we normally would. It sounds pretty straightforward and basic, but when lawyers are involved, nothing's straightforward and basic. And we really had to build trust you know, among the parties that it would work out, but then also come up with, you know, as we drafted legal documents, coming up with a way, like what's that gonna look like and how is that gonna work in a world where we're actually turning over a deed before we're done with our obligations on the construction side. So it was actually great. And you know, I personally learned a lot and was really happy to work with the partners at this table to come up with these solutions that we are now putting into practice on many other projects. Mm -hmm. So these issues are legal, but they're also business issues. Absolutely. They're risk mitigation issues. And it requires like alignment of a lot of parties around like what is the goal here? And mm -hmm. it sounds like having the library in the project was something that kind of like helped galvanize people to do business a little bit differently. So, Absolutely. Very cool. Um, we're going to go to pretty pictures now, and we will start with Christine Hunter <laughs> from MAP. Um, and I would love to just invite you, Christine, to talk a little bit about the design challenges that you were facing and how you resolved them. And, and please use pretty pictures to uh, bring us through. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. So can everybody see over us to the slides, I hope? Um, our design challenges started with the site. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and as Jay mentioned, um, the, the site you see in the aerial photo in red at the corner of 4th Avenue and 51st Street um, had been recently rezoned on the zoning map on the right. I'm sorry, the, um, you can see the yellow strip was of 4th Avenue was rezoned to R7A, but I should mention that the side, the the, that was only the 4th Avenue corridor and immediately adjacent to it on both sides were lower zones with, you know, Sunset Park's lovely brownstone blocks. So not only were we going to be the, the first, you know, tall building on 4th Avenue, but we also had to mediate, you know, the side street and sort of being respectful of those brownstones. Um, so we knew we were going to stick out. <laughs> uh, and also, um, across the street from the site, there is a National Register Historic District, um, not a city, not a, a landmark district um, under the Landmarks Preservation Commission, but a, but a national district that was subject to state regulation. So our early studies um, were studies about massing, and you can see two options on the left. The one on the top, massing option two, would be under the zoning, a typical way that you might zone this um, corner site, which is to go, you would be allowed to go up the full eight stories for a portion of both street frontages and then have to set back on the other fronts and a typical solution might be to emphasize that corner. 
but we knew that there was going to be a lot of height sensitivity. We knew that there was sensitivity about casting shadows across the street. So we also looked at massing option one, the one on the lower, um, the, the lower illustration, which held the street wall to six stories all the way around the building um, and ultimately decided to do that, uh, although it put more pressure on um, you know, how to get in all the, the floor area for the housing and the library that we would need. The section, the building section on the right shows our initial assumptions, which was that the library would occupy the basement and the first floor, and then you would have seven floors of housing above. Um, and then, yeah. And this uh, is a, these early floor plans just show the same design assumptions in a different view. So the library space in purple, which totals about 17,000 square feet, which is about 40% bigger than the old library. And from the start, we knew we would have to minimize the residential lobby, the entry lobby at the first floor, and also the core elements, including all the mechanical spaces and meter rooms to maximize the library space. And I will say, in retrospect, you always want to think, be very hopeful, so we probably underestimated the amount of mechanical space in the cellar. Um, so when these early plans were, and then above in these early plans, we had 57 units, and we were able to include a south-facing rear terrace above the first single-story portion of the library um, to make an outdoor space for residents. When these early plans were shared with the community board and other local groups, as Jay mentioned, there was um, a lot of concern that the library needed to grow even more. And so we started to study how to add space at the second floor while still preserving enough units to make the housing economically viable. Um, and typically 50 units is a kind of base for a viable, an economically viable project um, under kind of the terms of affordable housing financing. Um, we also discussed and, and uh, the, with the city getting some zoning accommodations to make this second floor possible and ultimately we did get um, the floor area constraints modified so that while we stayed within the same envelope we were able to get a little more residential floor area. So um, I'm just going to move to the uh, final plans. This is the site plan where you can see at the lower uh, left the, this outdoor terrace at the second floor level, which is a, um, as now that, well, I'll get to that, but um, which is primarily a residential space for the residents. And then you can see the library entry on the lower, um, the lower portion, uh, the southern portion frontage of Fourth Avenue and the residential entrance on 51st Street. And then um, the gridded portion of the roof is a solar array, which will, um, which will minimize the grid usage for the residential common areas. Uh, the final floor plans now show the library space in orange, now at the basement, first floor, and second floor for a total of about 70, 20, I'm sorry, for a total of about 20,000 square feet. The apartment count, we haven't shown all the upper floor plans here, is now at 50 units, again, the minimum as mentioned. And just moving, and the units are, again, as Jay mentioned, uh, quite a variety of sizes, uh, ranging from studios to three bedroom units and including some fully accessible units as well as the, um, the adaptable units that the city requires in all, um, in all elevator housing. Um, so the final exterior design has brick facades, which was requested initially by the landmarks group, the neighborhood landmarks groups that we met with. They were very particular. They wanted kind of materials that they felt really echoed what was there in the neighborhood. Um, so, um, and the two upper setback floors are in a lighter color uh, to sort of minimize that height. And this, the six-story brick street wall 
along the avenue, turns the corner and then steps down to, fifth, to five stories on 51st Street, creating a transition to the lower scale brownstones on the side block. The residential windows are large and include two shades of colorful blue panels that echo, also echo the Brooklyn Public Library colors, official colors. From a design point of view, I feel that one of the very positive results of all the community and stakeholder interactions on this project is the two-story library facade, which gives the library, I think, a much stronger visual presence in the neighborhood than if it were only at the first floor. Uh, and I believe that this new library will truly be a beacon on 4th Avenue and that the new this new building is now an appropriate first step to more density on, on, along this neighborhood corridor. Um, Great. Thank you so much. I think, I think we really got a sense of how things evolved over the course of the planning for the project and how it was responsive to community input. Very helpful. Um, Carol, so you were uh, from the uh, Mitchell Jergala, thank you, uh, firm. So you guys collaborated with MAP, and can you talk about the, the piece that you were brought in to do and what the particular design problems were that you were solving for in your firm? Um, absolutely. Um, first of all, um, it's been really interesting to hear all the pieces coming forward because often architects are brought in when all of that is resolved and I think us, the, uh, the architects can do a better job the more that we know and in particular uh, hearing from the lawyer from Christine about how, how you came to create the, the condo and the separation is really interesting and it really plays into some of the challenges that we faced from, from the get-go. I mean we understood from the beginning that FAC and MAP, um, let's see I need to let me go to the next image because here you'll see the, the library now zoomed in. That FAC, FAC and MAP would provide the corn shell for the library and that we would work within that framework. That is a, a common thing in New York that one architect might do corn shell and another one might do fit out. More unusual in, in this case to do a brand new building but a great model. Um, it was also understood that the apartment building and the library should have individual and yet complementary identities. And, um, I think that Christine was talking about some of the color passing through. We, we worked very closely on that. Um, it was, it w there was an easy step, the, um, the library entrance on 4th Avenue and the apartment entry on 51st Street was just an easy, very clear first step that was actually already in place uh, through the work that MAP was doing. Um, it was also, it, in our early conversations, it became apparent that the library should be extremely uh, transparent, open, and welcoming, while the apartment building would be more private and personal. Um, and so we again worked closely, and we continue to work closely with MAP, um, to coordinate materials and system selection. We haven't found HVAC as complicated <laughs> as, as you, um, because it's always complicated. And, and uh, you know, that's for another time. Uh, the, um, so I, this is a moment um, for a shout out to the Hester Gr Street Group. And, and they did work um, actually before we ever got involved. Um, what you see up there, and I have a copy here if anybody really wants to see the whole thing. Um, uh, the report produced by Hester Street documented the numerous discussions and workshops held with the community regarding the needs, dreams, and hopes for the new library. And the booklet documenting the community process really served as a vital roadmap for our work. Um, and in addition, both the central library staff and the staff at Sunset Park, as, as David said, they're just so wonderfully engaged, provided the inv invaluable reactions and feedback all along the way. Um, um, so, who did we collaborate with? Um, it was, we, obviously, we, we were collaborating with MAP and FAC on the infrastructure and building, building side. We, we had weekly meetings for months, um, just an hours at a time to just get, get all that. It was great, I mean, it was fantastic. And everybody showed up. Um, so we were, we were collaborating both with MAP and FAC, but then very intensely collaborating with the book, Brooklyn Public Library Central and, and the, the, the branch. Um, at, at, at this point, I just have to stop, look at the woman in the fourth row. 
and I, I just can't say enough about um, the Sunset Park head librarian, Roxana. Um, she is incredible, and her kind and gentle spirit really kept us on our toes as she revealed the unique culture, um, demographics, and needs of her community. Uh, we, we learned incredible things. She, we learned about the family who takes out 70 books at a time. Uh, you, that 70, it was, we, we really didn't believe, and then they returned 70, so where do you, what, what, what do you, like that book drop was really a serious issue. Um, and and uh, from the first time I met her, she was telling us about the people that come there, three different languages, where people speak Chinese, Spanish, English, um, Arabic is becoming much more uh, po you know, popular um, as, the, as the demographics change a bit. And we had to have books in every language, and it was just a mantra. No, we need, we need it, we need it, we need it. Everybody deserves to have their books. Um, we also spent a lot of time really understanding why the children, the teens, and the adults needed to have separate, unique spaces, and that it all had to be flexible, durable, and, and welcoming. Um, thank you, Roxana. Um, so finally, you can see, yeah. <laughs> Um, the, the, again, it goes back to a great architect, really. I mean, a great client can really lead to uh, much to great architecture. Um, so here we just have a few images. Uh, this, this is going to be the, the first floor, the entry floor. We are going to have a, um, a help desk reception uh, at, on every floor for each group. Um, and they will be very, it will be extremely flexible. And then... Uh, here we are up on the second floor, which I think Christine's right. Getting the two floors above grade was hugely important for, for the library. And it's, it's going to be, we've spent a lot of time talking about the kids and what, what um, opportunities they will have. Um, I, you, we had discussed um, amongst ourselves, uh, and I just wanted to say, you had said, you know, what, what kind of things would you tell, ask people or tell people for the future? And I think um, I would just encourage people to um, really listen carefully. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll have a Roxana. Um, and to always look at every project uh, in, as a new challenge and something unique. Um, engage the client constantly. In almost every part of it, they're going to have something valuable to say. Um, and then finally, for me, it's a revelation uh, every time, and this, this being with this group, but. Um, that our, as architects, we're kind of bit players in this process. Um, but when we work together with others, we can really accomplish so much more, and it, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity here. Great, great. I want to really underscore what you said about the importance of the client, because a client doesn't necessarily speak with one voice. And yeah. a client, you know, two clients collaborating who are porous to the community, porous to the, uh, the folks who use the library, it sounds like that was a key ingredient here. So Clarence, you gotta round us out. Um, we are gonna throw it open for questions in a couple of minutes, so start percolating them. Uh, but I would love, Clarence, for you to um, speak from the finance point of view. I mean, you, you also are com come along a little bit later in the process than all of this. Um, sure. You ha represent an institution that's thinking about risk and profit and all those fun things. So how does that, how does that factor into this story? Sure, yeah, I'd say, um you know, in speaking about risks, a lot of the unique challenges to this project, you know, were mentioned, um, you know, right from the beginning, you know, they did say we had two, you know, very engaged partners with, um, you know, the library and Fifth Avenue Committee. So, you know, we essentially have two clients. We have, you know, two purposes here with the building, two architects, you know, all of those different levels of complexity you know, add to potential risks. And then on top of that, you know, the, the headline risk, as, you know, as Jay mentioned, those 150 people that show up at the public hearing um, and scream at him, you know, one day I'm going to be, you know, on my way into the office and those 150 people pick up placards and are standing in front of the bank saying, hey, Clarence and his bank, you know, are financing the demolition of a public library to sell it to a private developer for a dollar, you know, and, all of these things are realistic things that we discuss in our credit committees. And um, you know, it's my job to understand the project well enough to be able to 
explain the mitigants to those uh, potential challenges that could come up. Um, you know, I think that first and foremost, really knowing the, uh, the neighborhood, I think that it helps that, you know, I live in Brooklyn, I live in Community District 6, familiar with Sunset Park. I know, um, you know, the rental dynamics and the things that are going on there, and we're able to, you know, speak to that firsthand. Um, and then also being able to speak with uh, confidence and familiarity about Fifth Avenue Committee, um, you know, about Galaxy, the uh, general contractor that's actually building the building, you know, to speak about the seriousness that uh, the Brooklyn Public Library was taking their, um, you know, public relations and their commitment that the community will never be without a library and, you know, ensuring that there would be a temporary space that is opened, you know, before the demolition began. You know, those are all, you know, very important elements. Um, you know, I think that, you know, as, as Christine mentioned, we've, we've negotiated on other projects before, and I think that having that dialogue and being able to talk about potential issues, I think that, um, unfortunately, sometimes banks' decisions may kind of seem to just come out of a black box and people not really understand why we take the position we do or why we um, present certain restrictions on projects that we do. But I think that having that dialogue and discussing saying, hey, these are our issues. Um, you know, what happens if there's a falling out and something is half built? And, you know, how do we overcome the, uh, you know, the use restriction that the, you know, the space ground floor has to be used for a library, but we're really concerned about the income generation, income generating portion of the project, which would be the residential tower above that. You know, being able to, to talk through those issues and, you know, potentialities is, is extremely important. Um, you know, I think that most lenders, uh, affordable housing lenders in New York City are comfortable with, you know, kind of the concept of multi-use buildings um, because so many of the locations are just suitable to have street level retail of some sort and then have affordable housing built above it. Um, you know, and this is, you know, unique in a lot of ways. Um, but one thing that, you know, ironically made it easier is that, you know, the library isn't going to be kind of a, a rent paying tenant. Essentially, once it's built, it's being given back for the use of the library, and we aren't dependent on any type of ongoing income from the library, which, um, you know, in a way, it's, it's very unique from something that we've ever done, but actually made it uh, easier to kind of get over that hurdle. I think that, you know, showing that the library and Fifth Avenue Committee had talked about a lot of things like the physical plant, about the um, ongoing maintenance and operations, and, you know, how those duties and expenses are going to be shared, those are all very important things that um, we saw that they were engaged in, you know, had given a lot of thoughtful consideration to um, how that's going to play out. Um, so, you know, I, I'd say I'd leave it with that, that it really would help to make sure that all of the partners are engaged and vocal and, you know, encourage your bank to speak up and say, well, what are your issues? What do you think of this um, sooner rather than later um, so that they can help explain and, uh, whatever you know, challenges or hesitations they may have can be overcome by you know, demonstrating that you know, you've thought about these issues and you know, can see a way through anything that could uh, potentially come up. Great, great, thank you. So I am gonna open it up for questions. Uh, and just to remind you guys, we'll do, at the end of questions, we'll do one more lightning round just on the, you know, less than a minute on like, what's the one piece of advice you'd give on sort of like the replication question for people who want to go and do this other places. But before we do that, are there questions in the audience? And I think there are microphones. Oh, a couple of ground rules around asking questions. Number one, introduce yourself and your affiliation so we can check your bias. Number two, <laughs> questions are like short and crisp and end with a question mark. Um, so please remember those ground rules as we go ahead. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, David Sokol. I'm associated with uh, City Tech, and also I'm a designer. Uh, all housing is affordable to someone. One of the questions I have is there needs to be a clear definition of what affordable means, because it's such 
a wishy-washy thing. And every time it comes up, this thing comes up. Mm -hmm. The second question is in terms of you introduced the idea of uh, what mistakes were learned, you know, what lessons were learned. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask David from, from Brooklyn, what lessons did you learn from the mistakes of the Brooklyn Heights project? And beyond that, what mistakes did you learn from the Donnell Library fiasco? And lastly, from a let, design... Let's do those two questions first, and then... A design question. Let, let, let so much glass on those first two stories. What methods did you use to mitigate the effect of light and heat transfer? So I, I forgot the third ground rule, which is one question per person, but let's <laughs> take these. Um, why don't we start with David, just in terms of like uh, the state of play of library uh, development. Um, I'm not sure to what, ex I guess the Brooklyn Heights Library would have been within the Brooklyn, Pu Brooklyn Public yeah, Library. Yeah, 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 so what's the state of play there? And then sure. we can, yeah. I, you know, I think the larger lesson for us um, through both projects uh, and even some of the other projects that we've been working on over the past few years, um, and I think this is a lesson for all three library systems over the past few years, is the importance of um, real dialogue with our, our patrons and the, and the communities we serve. If you look, look back to how we used to approach um, our, um, our facility projects um, and our renovation projects, um, just aside from the money, aside from how we do the construction, um, we would do those in a, in a, in a, in a vacuum. Um, and we wouldn't have the kind of dialogue that we had for this project through the Hester Street process that, that, that Carol described. Um, and so when we talk about who the client is, I mean, this may be obvious, but the, you know, the client really for all, all of us is the Sunset Park community. Um, but I don't know if in the past we were really living up to, uh, we were re really living up to um, having that kind of dialogue to inform projects with our communities. And I think we um, learned that lesson um, uh, uh, in part through Brooklyn Heights. I think we continue to learn it through this process and I think we got, I think we actually got better at it. We're now using um, uh, Hester Street um, for some of our other capital projects now. Um, and one of the interesting things about going through um, the this kind of community dialogue to inform capital projects is it's sort of a, it's a it's a twofer because we actually as part of the design process we're actually hearing from community stakeholders not just about what the building should look like um, but what programs should be put in place um, and so um, that process that we went through for this project is actually going to be a tool for Roxanne and her team going going forward we had new people who hadn't been part of the library community come in during that process. Um, so I think um, in lots of ways we're getting a lot we're getting a lot better at that. Great. So Jay, just to uh, translate the affordability question to you, I mean, sure. you know, affordability is defined around yeah. percentages of area median income and like various right. striations and and sort of city and state have kind of aligned around those definitions. How did you guys approach the question of affordability and the mixed income? Uh, ranges, how did you think about it as Fifth Avenue Committee for this site? Um, we very much look by the neighborhood median, not by the area-wide median, and that's where we start. Um, we also make sure we look at where the housing need is. So while the, there's a median income, typically people above the median and for your neighborhood don't have necessarily the substantial housing burden, paying more than 30 or 50 percent of their income to rent, um, less not live uh, less chance of living in overcrowded housing, uh, less distress. So we typically look at where the housing need is for that particular community. <clears throat> so here, and again, this is another case where the funders were more flexible. They usually don't like a lot of different income strata, but, but we knew because that it's frustrating for people when they're a dollar income too low or a dollar income too high and all of a sudden they're not eligible. So we set at 30, 40, 50, 60 percent, and then we do have uh, nine units at 80 percent. Um, so we really set it to the neighborhood. Um, it makes it tougher for us because we, we are dedicated, um, and to Carlos's point about long, um, permanent public usage for this, 
permanently affordable housing for this um, to make sure we're going to be economically viable in 30 years with the average rents being as low as they are. Um, but that was mitigated by putting the nine units at 80% of median, which is still a need in the community. Um, and also we got, uh, luckily, thanks to New York State, we got some Section 8s, project-based Section 8s for eight of the units as well. So that also enabled us to know we can keep it permanently affordable even though we have very low average rents. But to answer your question, it should be, and I think the city is very sympathetic to this, always be based on neighborhood, not necessarily the area median income. Actually, can I jump in on Please. that? Um, we build for New York City. We, we are the city housing agency. Right now, projects that we build, this, this project and everything else, there's when everything goes, any unit that is not designated for homeless households goes through a lottery process. There is, at the moment, a community preference. I won't say anything more than that because we were being sued for that as a fair housing violation. But our job is to build for New York City. So, you know, certainly it is important to hear from communities to what they want, but we also have to be looking broader. And the, the expectation is that um, households may be coming from other parts of New York City. So I, I, I don't want to uh, set up the expectation that everybody in the building is going to be from the local community. Everybody from the building will effectively be for New York City, from New York City, although it's not a requirement. Um, you get, uh, fall to the bottom of the lottery log and just given the numbers, there's no way that anybody who's not a New York City resident is, is ever going to get placed in HPD housing. And just to underscore, the levels of affordability, the different striations, it's all connected to the subsidy involved, the capital that's available. In this case, you were able to line up your aspirations with the city and state agencies to be able to get there in terms of where those uh, affordability were. Again, I will mention again, though, it was an exception, actually, to their rule. They don't like this many gradations, but I think they understood uh, the issue. I did want to make one other thing. I do hope, because I understand that I agree with the Fair Housing Advocates on community board preference, in many areas not being a good thing, but I hope there'll be carve out for neighborhoods like Sunset Park where there really is a diversity of income and, uh, and primarily lower income. I, I defer to the courts, can't speak <laughs> to that one. Um, you know, we actually are thrilled to have projects with a lot of different income bands. It's something we are doing um, very frequently. Everything has a homeless set aside, but we're also, because we are so focused on making sure that we are getting, um, we want to have extremely low income units that are going through the lottery. We also, we need to make sure the buildings are financially sustainable, so we're really trying to incorporate moderate income units. Um, I think it is, it is rare that we're doing a project of any size that doesn't have uh, four to six income bands at this point. So we've been talking about a project that's fully baked, but this is the dialogue that's like, you know, plays out in real time every time one of these projects comes along. So, and the dialogue continues. Uh, any other questions uh, in the audience for these uh, experts? Oh, there's a hand in the in the back. Um, uh, um. And introduce yourself. Keep it crisp. End with a question mark. One per customer. Go. Okay. <laughs> I'm Morgan Hare. I'm a partner at Leroy Street Studio. Also one of the founders of Hester Street Collaborative. Um, we did the, the temporary library, and one of the aspects of that was that it was a design-build um, process, which enabled us to work with um, a local uh, community group, Center for Family Life, to do an installation. And I was wondering if the library system was considering moving forward with that model. Um, I mean, a couple of pieces of that. First of all, there, I think there's now design build legislation pending in, in Albany that the libraries are supportive of, um, and that would give us and give the city more, more, more flexibility. Um, the art project was with, uh, with the students was fantastic. I know Carlos was part of that as well. Um, yeah, we would love, would love to do more of, uh, more, more of those. And can you just underscore the difference between the design, design build approach versus business as usual? Sure. Um, business as usual is, you know, design is, is separate from construction. It ends up taking much, much longer, multiple procurement processes, design build, you can do all at once. The, the, the interim library 
um, was uh, sort of an, an ex exceptional project that we had to move along really, really uh, quickly, and it worked out worked out quite, quite, quite well. And there's also we don't have images of it here today, but as I think uh, uh, Carlos had said, go go take a look at it. It's really it's a beautiful, beautiful space. I think we have time for one more question. Is there? All questions answered. Last one, anyone? Okay, then I will go back to my lightning round question, um, and let's do it, you know, fast and furious. One thing that practitioners and people who want to replicate this should think about, or you know, a pearl of wisdom you want to drop um, for uh, for everyone here. Uh, why don't we start with Clarence, since we're usually getting to you last. Sorry to mm -hmm. throw a curveball at you. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say the, uh, the bit of wisdom is, yeah, engage your uh, banker early and, you know, throw a lot of possible <laughs> questions and scenarios at them and, and see how they react. And, um, yeah, and, and also to add some context to this, this is, you know, as was mentioned earlier, I'm sorry I'm not being crisp, but had been under um, thought for a long time and a lot of things happened um, with tax reform, which changed the economics of the tax credit investment. Um, be flexible and think about, you know, potential scenario changes that can differ from what you see now and what things could potentially be like, you know, two years from now. Great. Carol. Um, okay, so I, I sort of did this out of order, so, uh, but I would just reiterate that uh, engage your client. Um, they're, they're absolutely invaluable. As, get as much from them as often as you can, and, um, just to, to listen very carefully and, and understand the impact that you're going to have because designing a library is just the greatest gift for any architect and it's a, it's a great honor and to take it very seriously. So great. enjoy it. Christine Hunter? Um, just, I would just say, you know, complex projects are possible and ask for what you need. So, you know, we really did... Um, get flexibility from the city and you know some of the agencies that are usually just sort of more in a regulatory capacity and that all the dialogue was very positive. Right. Christine Coletta? Um, I would say spot issues early, spot issues often, and uh, walk up to them you know, and, and deal with them with your partners in, a, in, a, in as much of a transparent way as you can. Cole? Uh, I think transparency and engagement, so bringing the government agencies in up front and being transparent with us in the entire process, even if you hit a big roadblock, letting us know what it is and being part of the solution is, is helpful. Councilman? I think that the future of the city is going to be based out of allowing neighborhoods to determine their own future as we change and grow. And I think what you saw here was an incredible group of people who did that um, in service to the neighborhood. And at the core, I think, of what was happening here was the library. And I, and I loved hearing everyone's stories in connection to the library and the power of library. And because I think we, we, we believe that it's not just the building, it's the people that do the work, the magic of the library, the librarians and the people who come. And so I think this is just an example of how when we allow communities to take lead, and, uh, and if they are the client, and, and build everything around that, beautiful things like this can keep happening. And I think that we have a lot to learn from this and model and push out. Great, Molly. Uh, for all the different parties that are involved, uh, library, the housers, the, the agencies, um, know what are your, your must-haves and what are the points where there can be flexibility, and I think be prepared to talk through those things. Um, you know, this is an example of a project that got very close to giving a lot of things to everybody, but nothing is gonna give everything to everybody, right? So where are the places where there can be um, some, some flexibility, right? The, the losing units to get to the second floor was an example of that. What are, in each project, where those, where the flex is, is gonna differ, and know what you're gonna draw a hard line and what you won't. Jay? Um, I'd say uh, one key thing is, you know, there are always a lot of interesting um, potential for how to beat community needs, but you got to figure out the one that's really going to be able to happen. And a lot of part of that is choose the right 
people to be working with. So uh, we were very lucky when we approached the library. Not only do we have people like David who are very knowledgeable, very thoughtful, but I guess Christy isn't here now, but Christy, uh, the person <coughs> I, I could tell immediately, okay, there's gonna be a lot of tough times, but Christy's gonna really be with us here and work it. It's someone who was very bright, very sharp, caught problems before they happened, and was as eager as we are to move the project as fast as possible. So I said early on, you know, there are a lot of projects we were thinking of doing, but this is the one that'll work because we've got the right partners. And then FAC is very lucky. We have long-term partnerships with both MAP and Hershen Singer and Epstein, and they've always come through with us. We knew the city was eager and, and the state for projects more creative like this. And we have new players too, like we've been very excited that the uh, owner's rep is, is one of our partners now in a day-to-day -day basis with construction. They were here at WPA, um, and uh, we knew that they'd help us get through the tough excavation issues that are coming up on a daily basis. So I think choosing the right team is really important and early on assessing whether this team is gonna be able to get you through what you know is going to be a tough project. David, last, last um, look, the, 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 the quick answer is, not surprisingly, is going to be the importance of engaging na neighborhood stakeholders. But I'm going to cheat a little and give a slightly longer answer since I'm the last, since I'm the, the last, the last one. Um, for, for, first of all, uh, Jay referenced Christy Maduro, who's part of the BPL team, and uh, um, sort of kept her eyes on all pieces of the project. And it was really important because it was so complicated um, for future projects. Um, you know, the libraries need to have somebody like that who is sort of minding the store and watching, watching all the pieces. Um, you know, one, one little piece that sort of gets lost the, in the shuffle is what, what's going to be here at the end of the day. We're going to have a, a building with, uh, afford, with affordable housing and a library right there for them. I, I, um, uh, just a quick personal thing. I, I grew up in Michelama housing, and in my big Michelama building was a community room that was, it was always empty. There was never anything, ha it was, and even then it struck me as such a, a waste of space that the kids in these families who are gonna be living in this building are gonna have a library <laughs> right downstairs. And I think one of the really interesting things for us to see um, is uh, how, how great is that gonna be? Um, how much did they use a the library? What an opportunity for Roxanne and her team to work with the kids and the families in that building, and it's one of the, uh, um, you know, we sort of forget about it, but at the end of the day, that's really what we're going to have, and to the extent this can get replicated um, with more housing in other locations, it's um, an exciting, uh, exciting uh, uh, piece of what we're, all, what we're all doing here. Please join me in uh, celebrating our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, Michelle de la Uz will uh, close us out. I just want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank the panel. I want to thank Sam for doing a great job moderating. Absolutely fabulous job. Um, I just want to say that um, when people get their leases, we're going to make sure that they sign up for their library cards at the same time. <laughs> Do both. Get your keys, your lease, and your library card. And um, we absolutely, you know, we'll stick around for questions. Um, and I, I, I just want Roxana to stand up. She's been had a shout out. But, you know, Roxana, do me a favor, stand up. This is Roxana Benavides. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, thank you all. And um, I know I'm going to see some of you in about a month at uh, FAC's annual uh, reception. And um, uh, once again, I want to thank uh, Julie Sandor from the Revson Foundation for um, really inspiring many of us uh, to um, really focus on what libraries mean in our communities and bringing out the best of, in all of us to um, you know, meet those community needs. So thank you all. Thank you.